Welcome right back once again to another episode of the A Light Show with your co host, Mike Dowd. We have the mob, the mafia, and the man. And John is, uh, I don't know, not the man. And we have uh, for the people who hit the subscribe button, hit the comments. We have a legendary commentator that uh, is an incredible human being and uh, seen it all and then some. So we just want to say hello to Larry. Larry Merchant, how are you? I'm doing all right for an old man. Yeah, well, you look fantastic for the people that uh, are listening in and taking a look at him. You still look the same same old Larry, actually. Yeah. You're looking good. <laughs> Thank you. Your flattery will get you nowhere. Uh, yeah. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but Larry, that, I, I'm Michael Dowd. I, I'm sure you don't know who I am, and I, and that's fine. I, but we know who you are, and that's and that's really a, both an uh, honor and a pleasure. And, and I'm excited and nervous to talk to you because... I'm not a great big boxing fan, but I do remember Cassius Clay and Sonny Liston. And by that, I mean, I remember hearing about it because I was a young lad back then, you know, now I'm in, I'm 61 today. So you, I'm sure you could uh, bring me right back from that day all the way forward. Uh, but before we get into that, just, just, I, I want to ask you a question. Who was, name me for me, your, your favorite fight and your favorite fighter. There's got to be, if they're not the same. Well, my favorite fight, which many people regard as uh, the greatest heavyweight fight, was the third fight between um, Ali, Ali Frazier. and uh, Frazier. and Fraser in the Philippines. I fucked the thriller in Manila. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it turned out to be a real thriller in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Were you uh, you had a could a relationship with these guys on a personal level also, or just in the ring and it was uh, strictly business commentating? Well, I was around so many of the fights of the uh, elite fighters that we got to know each other. I had interviewed them um, numerous times. Um, and some of it became a little personal and some of it was just business. Yeah. You know, I, I was friendly with Joe Frazier. Right? He was a Philadelphia guy. I had a house outside of Philly. I go to Atlantic City. So I got friendly with him at, at a certain point uh, later on as he retired. But uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, I had the utmost respect for. I thought to me, he was one of the greatest fighters ever in the, in, uh, in the boxing world. But uh, I agree a... with you. Um, Joe Frazier learned to fight in Philadelphia when I was sports editor of the Philadelphia Daily News. Um, and I knew him and liked him and invested in him hmm. as a kind of stunt when they were putting together a group of businessmen and others to buy shares in Fraser. Uh, I bought a share. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember. I know it was not very much money. Uh, a couple of hundred bucks, maybe. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out it, three or four months Later, I had to, uh, I was moving to New York to work at the New York Post. And um, I needed money for an apartment. And I sold my share for a couple thousand dollars. This is crazy. A couple of years after that, the share was worth a couple of hundred thousand. <laughs> he never stopped kidding me about getting out too early. <laughs> wow. I, I, that's got to be a story that no one even really knows about. This yeah. is crazy. <laughs> so, Larry, I, I, I mean, besides seeing you at some of the high profile boxing matches throughout the years, I didn't know you were a writer. You were a writer for The Post? I was a columnist in Philadelphia and New York for 20 years. 
Did you know that, Sean? Yeah. You know what, uh, Larry? Were you familiar with? Uh, 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 there's a writer that wrote my book, uh, George Anastasia. Him and his brother used to write for the Philadelphia papers. Were, did you know any of them back in the day? The name is sort of familiar to me, but I can't say I knew them. Yeah. So uh, l let me ask you another question. He didn't get finished my question. Go ahead. What is it? I asked him who was his favorite match. He said the Thriller of Manila. But who was the, maybe I'll ask it a different way. Who was the fighter that you, I mean, you could say Muhammad, you could, Ali, you could say Frazier, but who was the fighter that you most sort of admired other than the guys that we know that anybody would know? What guy was that was really, maybe didn't reach his potential or, or, or you know, got, it got stolen? Well, it was there were a number of elite fighters that I liked. And because of the nature of my job, uh, those are the ones I went to see. Um, but uh, Leonard, Hearns, and Hagler. Oh, they were great fights. Were all, they had great fights with each other. They were real old-fashioned old fighters. Uh, Sugar Ray Robinson once said that Sugar Ray Leonard was better than he was. Maybe Robinson had had a couple of drinks, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but they were just outstanding fighters. You, you know, Larry, I did an interview with Jerry Cooney on his show, and I asked Jerry Cooney off the show what he thought about Marciano uh, compared to some of uh, the fighters like, you know, Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali, Tyson. Where, where would you put him with these guys? Sonny Liston, uh, Marciano. Look, all that a fighter can be that we can be sure of is to be the best in his time. Marciano was the best in his time. Yeah. Could he have competed with the new age super heavyweights? Probably not. He, he weighed in the high 180s. Yeah, right? you, I believe his, right, 186 or something. At his peak. I, inter I interviewed Marciano a couple of or three times. And, and in your opinion, I think, in my opinion, one of the greatest trainers ever was Emmanuel Stewart. Did you have any kind of conversations? And what did you think of him? I thought he was he great. He revived boxing in, in uh, Detroit. Uh, Hearns was the, the major figure in, in that uh, new wave. But... You know, Emmanuel, even though he was in the corner of many champions, he loved it no matter what level. In between big fights, he'd be driving caravans of amateurs to amateur shows. Yeah. He really loved it and uh, was a great friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was a he was really a gentleman. I met him on a couple occasions, and uh, I really like he was a, just a genuine human being. Yeah. Well, I was at his memorial in in Detroit. What's her name? The famous singer who sang "Respect." Aretha, Aretha Franklin. Franklin. Yeah. She was there. She she sang. Um, it seemed all of the elite Detroit figures were there because he was a citizen and a, and, and, uh, a good man. Was Jimmy Hoffa there? Yeah, Jimmy Hoffa in those days. Well, I, I lost my... I don't have the same eyesight I once had to see where he would be buried. <laughs> but you got the you got the wits you got the wits to know how to take a ground ball <laughs> hey larry here's a question for you 
And uh, and I'm not sure if you guys ever made up. And I know you know, I'm going to bring up the Mayweather situation. What what did you think of that? And did you guys make up after that little bit of uh? Yes, he apologized. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's nice to later. hear. That's a good week or two later. Yeah. Um, yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. Well, sometimes uh, that's the, that's that's the that's as simple as that. That's great. I mean, he's a he's a great fighter, and I got to tell you, he's an even better better father. He's a his his kids are, are well well uh, uh, they brought up with uh, a lot of class. His kids, so he's doing something right with his children. I'll tell you that. You know. Well, that's good to hear. He's a, he's made more money than whole rankings of fighters have in the past. Wow. And he did it by being shrewd enough to exploit television and HBO's um, uh, little 20 or 30 minute pieces on the fighters before the fight. Uh, he was very smart. You were with HBO for what, 35, 40 years? You were with them for a long time, right? Yes. Hmm. Yes. How about as far as working with other announcers like uh, uh, Howard Cosell or someone, some I of the legendary? Worked. I knew Cosell. I never worked with him. You, you work with Lampley, I believe, right? With uh, Jim. I work with Jim Lampley. Yeah. Uh, in, in that great era in the 80s, 90s, Emmanuel, uh, Jim, and me were the the team. Yeah. Did you ever, Larry? Did Did you ever watch a fight where, while watching the fight, you know this guy's not putting out? And you know what I mean? Like the guy was just basically throwing the fight. Well, I saw a thrown fight, but it was long before I was at HBO. Oh. When I came out of the army in the in the early fifties, I went to a fight at Madison Square Garden with my uncle who had fought some amateur fights, as many uncles had in that time. Right, 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 right. And um, Willie Pep was fighting a fighter from East Harlem. I can't think of his name. He was a very good, good fighter. Could he catch Willie? Because Willie was lightning. And Willie went down in the second round. I caught him. I mean, who Willie Pep does not go down in the second round <laughs> for nobody and, uh, or ever. Yeah. And um, in the next day's paper, a great sports writer who I I almost worshipped along with a few others uh, called it a, 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 a dump, and it turned out to be correct. Wow. Well, that would have been scandalous. That would have been. You have to understand something. Back in that day, fighters or their managerial teams could make more money betting on the fight yeah. than they could from the fight itself. Wow, yeah. yeah. Now they make now so much right. money that there's no reason right. to sabotage your career if, if you might make $20 million after right. three more wins. Right. Right. Well, that's really interesting, though, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, Teddy Atlas uh, is very verbal about some of the the uh, inside stuff that goes on in, in the boxing world. And he's, he has a keen, a, he's a keen observer. Yeah. Very uh, knowledgeable, knowledgeable guy. And I think he's one of the greatest also. Uh, what I wanted to ask you was, what do you think of now the up and coming UFC and MMA compared to the boxing world. How come you haven't asked me about the women's boxing? Guys? Yeah, I'm going to get to Christy Martin next because I'm bringing her on. What, the round girls? <laughs> you remember Christy, right, uh, Larry? I went down to Florida to interview her. Yeah, yeah. She... Well, we'll be in Florida next week if you want to join us. You can get any time, Larry. <laughs> um, she was the best schooled a woman's fighter I had, ever, I had seen up until that moment. Yeah, I and agree. others model themselves on her. Yeah, but a million dollars for two women's 
uh, women in a, in a fight at the garden recently, unheard of. One way or another, hand-to-hand -hand combat is going to make a come is going to restore itself. Uh, whether it was MMA or UFC or any of those things, which I don't follow, uh, I'm not a big fan of street fights. There's a way they'll get around to having hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, so if fans love that and want to see it, good. But don't tell me that you can put in a MMA fighter, no matter how good, with a boxer champion and expect him to, to do anything more than a four-round fighter could do. Yeah. Ain't going to happen. Yeah, I'm in a total agreement with you. They just they don't have the same ability as a boxer. But on the other hand, you can't put a boxer in with a UFC fighter that's going to take you to the ground or use their legs. Right, right. If you knock a guy down in boxing, you can't just get on your knees and pummel him. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I once saw uh, a Jersey native of and friend. Uh, um, Kurt we Wepner. Wepner, yeah, Chuck. Chuck. And he had an exhibition against Andre the Giant uh. at Shea Stadium, which was an, a, a, an undercard fight. Andre the Giant, in about the second round, picked him up and threw him out of the ring. And, Wepner, and Wepner was about six, four, or five. And 280 or 260 or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was a big guy, Chuck Webb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if Andre, he had, if, if, if Andre the Giant had to box him, forget it. No, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. He couldn't box him. <laughs> so, Larry, were you born and raised in the Philadelphia area? No, I'm from New York. Oh, you are. Um, I went off to Oklahoma University uh, from, from my college. Uh, education uh, when I was 16. Um, and then I worked around in the army. I was at Stars and Stripes in Europe, Associated Press in Wilmington, North Carolina, Daily News. Just, just for one moment, Larry, I happened to be on the cover of Stars and Stripes, just so you know. You were. I was on the cover of Stars and Stripes. Why? <laughs> Excuse me? Why? Oh, oh, nothing. <laughs> it wasn't a good thing. <laughs> no, no. I was. Oh, I, I get a flip. I get a phone call. My my family gets a phone call from Europe. It's uh, my current at the time I was married, to, and my wife's name was whatever Bonnie, and her brother was uh, in the service, and he was stationed in Germany, right? So that's where the stars and stripes, I guess, is promulgated out there. And uh, the phone rings. It's someone from Europe. It's my brother-in-law. I want to know, is that our Michael on the front cover of the Stars and Strike newspaper? So, yeah, I was on the cover. I was a New York City police officer that got jammed up. So I, I ended up on, on the front cover of Stars and Stripes. Johnny, have you been on the front cover of Stars and Stripes? <laughs> no, not on okay. Stars and Stripes. All right. So there you go. I beat you on that one. <laughs> not a very nice idea though don't try to don't try to get there that the way i did so la where, where'd you grow up what the uh, i grew up in new york in what town uh what's it uh, in, in brooklyn i was born in the bronx and we lived in upper manhattan way up in the 180s right and then when i was 10 we moved to uh brooklyn okay can i see where can i see Crown Heights? Uh, bensonhurst bensonhurst so, 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 Larry, here's the thing about you, you know, and uh, people talk about your career, talk about how humble you are. And do the people, when they see you on the street, still realize you're the same Larry Merchant? Do they still give you that attention? I get, I get it sometimes. I was in a, in a grocery market recently and some uh, young girl who worked there came up to me and re had recognized me. And I said to her, if I was 50 years younger, I'd be chasing you all over the 
<laughs> I love it. <laughs> See, I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I hope she said, don't worry, you can still chase you can, me. Yeah, if you can catch me, you can have me. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, it's nice to, to see because guys like you just aren't around like they used to be. I mean, it's just a completely different world. They're a dying breed. Different era. And uh, I mean, for us, it's hats off to you, honestly. Uh, who else would you say is one of the uh, best people you were involved in announcing with in, in your career as from a young man all the way up? Well, I like Roy Jones. He really knew the inside of boxing and he, 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 he was a professional athlete and he, he anticipated things and could see things that a journalist just doesn't have. I thought Bobby Ches was, and not because I'm good friends with him, but I thought he was a great commentator too. He's I very well spoken. Uh, I like Bobby Ches. Uh, I saw him in my, what might have been his last fight, right, uh, at, at at the Garden in in the in the smaller room. Felt for him, yeah. Um, and he was a good guy and a good fighter. Yeah. 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 We spent some time with him. He happens to be. He happens to be brilliant, by the way, like on the scale, you know, on a brilliant scale. He's like a, he's like a 160 or 180 IQ guy. Like he's really like so smart. He's weird, <laughs> but he's a, but he's a, he's a, he's a good soul. You know, he's out there still. How about the guys like Duran? Were you in, ever announced a fight of Duran's fights? Yes. Duran was one of the, one of the great greats. Uh, What's your uh -huh. opinion on that Duran no Mas fight with Leonard? Was it frustration, you believe, or is it something other than your, your opinion? All I know is what I saw with my eyes. And what I saw with my eyes was just, he was frustrated. He knew he couldn't beat a Ray Leonard in their rematch. Who would box like that? Yeah. Move all around. He couldn't handle him. No mas. And here's another fight that was very controversial that, in my opinion, Hagler won. Hagler Leonard. I thought Hagler won, but it was very close and it could have gone the other way. Yeah. But what happened in that fight was that Leonard won the drama of the fight. 100%. He hadn't fought in a in a long while, uh, he had overcome an eye operation. Yep. And no, not many people thought he was competitive against Hagler. Yeah. In fact, the day before the fight, I went to speak to Ray with, with some of my team members, and he was getting a, a massage. And he said, who do you like in a fight? And I said, Ray, I have to go with Hagler, but I hope I'm wrong. And I was wrong, and I was okay with that. <laughs> I mean, it was That's a very close fight. <laughs> it was a very close fight. And a fighter who wins the drama of the fight, which can include many different essences, for example, he was an, he was the underdog, right? And the fans started to cheer as soon as they saw he was competitive, right? And they were cheering through the fight. And close rounds can go, to, the go to that fighter, yeah. um, and so he won some of those close rounds and he won the fight by split decision, was it? Yeah, it was split decision. Um, Leonard knew how to steal rounds. Yeah. He knew yeah. how to light it up. At the, yeah. end, at the end of the round and so forth, Hagler never put on gloves again in his life. Yeah. And he was offered 10 figures, eight figures, $10 million, I believe, which in today's money is 
probably 25 or 30 right. a rematch. Yeah. yeah. He didn't he didn't want to do it anymore. Well, and, Hagler wasn't and let me say and let me say this. Hagler lost the fight by not fighting like Hagler. Yeah. He wanted to prove that he could that he dance. could box with the great boxer. Yeah. See, that's what guys all do. of his life he was envious of Leonard because Leonard became a star shooting right out of the 1976 Olympics. The Olympics, yeah. Right? And and Hagler had to do it the hard way. He had to beat three or four tough Philadelphia fighters, a couple of whom beat him. Mm -hmm. And so he was he, he thought that was the wrong thing to happen to him. And then he oh, he always swore You'll see real boxing when I fight Leonard. Yeah. That was not his game. Yeah. His game was when he came out against Hearns, punching his gloves in the corner, he was going to confront Hearns. Yeah. And boy, did he. Yeah. Yeah. Leonard was a showman. Right. And Hagler was a gr one of the greatest right. body punches yeah, I ever a seen. Grinder, a grinder. And yeah. And Hagler didn't have the personality. He was very humble and quiet that didn't know how to overwin the crowd the way Leonard did. Leonard just was he great. Didn't start, that was not his style. Yeah, right. he no. Was a, right. He was a stalking, patient yeah. fighter to break you down. Yeah. Right. That's a damn good thing if you can do it well on the, right. on the right. top level. Yeah. Well, but well, I thought case, Hagler was a great fighter. I just thought he I never got his due as a great fighter. He's one of the greatest ever also. Look, if you ask me for one of my favorite fighters again, <laughs> I'll tell you Hagler and Hearns. Yeah. It was eight minutes of pure fury. Yeah. They were great. All those fighters. You got Tyson time. Fury. You had Antifermo yeah. and Hagler. You yeah. had Hearns and, and uh, uh, Leonard. You had... That whole Duran and the, 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 it was such group of great fighters at that era. Yeah, I have a trivia question for both you guys. Who was the first guy to knock down Sugar Ray Leonard? Whoa. Um, you don't know it, do you? No, I don't. I don't know. I try to remember. Oh, uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather's father. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe who was it? Uh, the kid who was it? Was the, the kid from Boston? Boston? The kid from Boston, Mickey. Uh, oh, Mickey Ward. Mickey Ward's the first guy to knock him down. Well, I think it was. I think Floyd's father, Floyd <laughs> Senior, might have stepped on, on his foot. On his foot. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> the first official knockdown. What I, from my understanding, was okay. Uh, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I Mickey know, Ward knocked I, I him down. I don't remember it, but yeah. okay. In Madison Square Garden, though. Yeah. Uh, mm. Those were some great fights, too. Ward and Gaddy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Later on. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. They, they, you didn't have to be a fight fan to love that. You didn't have. No. Yeah. <laughs> and what's that other guy? Yeah, you had the other from Rhode Island. The Rhode Island Boom what, what, what? Boom Boom Mancini. Boom Boom Mancini. Oh my God, those guys could swing. Well, of those guys, Palomino back in those days. <laughs> Palomino was a great fighter. You didn't want to get in the ring with them guys because you were, see, everyone was getting hurt. <laughs> yeah. So, Larry, do you miss it? Do you miss the action? Look, I could see you. Though. Oh, you know what? I had a great run. All right. I was All very right. fortunate. To be with HBO, uh, I had never done it. I had done broadcasting, but not uh, anything like being a, a, a commentator of a live event. Uh, but I had a great boss. His name is Seth Abraham, who ran the department. We're still pals. And once after I had said something negative about one of our contract fighters, the blowback was that everybody was unhappy, okay? And he said to me, Larry, you make my job harder. Okay. Meaning, when he went into a negotiation, with a fighter I may have 
not adored. <laughs> um, he heard about it. Oh, well. But then he said, keep doing what you do. Sure. I was lucky in that, that I had a boss like that. Yeah. Most guys. Today, today you'd be in the woke, the woke society would have you canceled in the second. <laughs> They'd cancel you right out. What, I mean, <laughs> well, there's so much money at stake today. Yeah, that's true. Um, and that's what it's about. When we had a new boss, in the first, in our first meeting, it wasn't a formal meeting, it was an informal meeting. He said to me, Larry, you got to lay off Floyd a little bit. There's, a, there's hundreds of million do of dollars involved in this. I never laid off Floyd. <laughs> yeah. Fuck that. <laughs> you know, they hired me to be me. Yeah. Not to be them. Can yeah. I, I, can I, yeah. uh, I loved your personality because you pushed fighters. Yeah. And that's the, that what everybody wants to see. They want to hear the truth come out of him and you kind of brought it out of him one way or another, right. which was unique. Well, yeah, and it's, it's good. Sometimes occasionally controversial, which is good for a, a show. You're not it's good for get, a show, yeah. You're not going to get pap. Um, but I never forgot that comment from my boss. You make my job harder. But keep doing what you do. Keep doing what you do. That's what I keep telling John. He makes my job harder. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, keep doing what you do. So, <laughs> you know, we like to laugh, Larry. So we're all over, you know, we're doing shows and we do talks and lectures around different, you know, around the world and around this country, other countries. And, and, you know, basically most of it is just trying to be genuine and laugh at the same time. There's no reason you can't laugh. That's right. If you um, can't laugh, yeah. When, I, when I was a writer, I was part of a, a movement in the sports world that was the equivalent of what was called the new journalism, which was you hung around and hung around and hung around and got the real stories on the on the ground and uh you told them some of them were or most of them were good some of them were not and uh uh and i love that role that you could you could be fun there's no reason you can't have fun in it whatever what is a sports event yeah yeah it's a sports event. Yeah. It's not life and death, although for fighters, it might be a yeah. little bit of that. Right. Um, but people come for entertainment. It's they entertainment. come to cheer and root. Uh, and if you can give somebody at home a smile, hell, that's great. Yeah, I don't like what they're doing now, Larry, in all the sports. They're bringing politics into yeah, yeah. sports. They're ruining it. And they're leaving people go to sports to get away from the real world and enjoy themselves and and root and, and laugh. When you start bringing politics, in my opinion, they're diminishing the uh, the activity and, and the uh, the entertainment of, of the sport that you love, whether it's, you know, boxing, football, baseball, hockey, whatever. Basketball. Yeah. You can't. Basketball. Basketball, too. Yeah. You know, I once said something. Your favorite uh, friend in basketball? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Larry. It's all right. Um, we were in El Paso. And the, the mayor of El Paso, I think he was, was concerned about the possibility of drug gangs uh, coming out and disturbing the peace. Um, I think Oscar De La Hoya was fighting. Um, he put on some good fights, didn't he, Larry? Yes, he sure did. He, yeah. he was a hell of a fighter. Yeah. He fought everybody, didn't yeah. duck anyone. Yeah, he didn't duck anybody. Yeah. He was tough. He, he fought everybody. Yes. 
I mean, fighting a guy like, like uh, um, the great middleweight. Um, Aguayo? No, 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 from Philadelphia, from West Philadelphia. Oh, you're talking Bernard Hopkins. Uh, Bernard Hopkins. It was suicide. <laughs> but it was, a, it was money. It was a thing. And he fought him. Um, I don't El know. Paso where... with the drug gang, the drug gangs, the mayor was worried about the drug gangs coming out to the fight. Yeah. And so word was passed to me in rehearsal. We do our rehearsal. Right. And in rehearsal, I remarked about the fact that they had made a deal with the promoter that there wouldn't be any beer sold out of fight. I never heard of a of a fight, a big fight, or maybe any fight where they make that kind of a deal. Right. And uh, I thought, if you're at home, you should know this. And I told the story anyway. Um, and it was a kind of riotous situation, but a good fight. And uh, but nobody could blame it on having too much beer. <laughs> so it was still, it was still not a good scene. Is that what you're trying to say? Well, no, that's what I'm trying to say is that when I had a new uh, head of the boxing division um, who wanted to build his reputation more than the fighters, um, that's what you come against. You know, he was concerned with with how it would look and appear and how difficult it would make his job instead of how good, better it would make his department. Yeah. You know, go back to Bernard Hopkins when you mentioned him. We used to train with him, uh, Prince Badi, his trainer, Denny Brown. We were down at the firehouse in Jersey. He had to be one of the most disciplined fighters I ever seen and one of the most intelligent fighters I ever seen. Who is that? Bernard Martin. Hopkins. Yes, he was. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. One he, of the greatest through history, I'd say. He was yeah. determined when he got out of prison, he was determined almost not to drink anything stronger than ginger ale. Yep, yep. And he was not going back in there. No. And in very, West very Philly, disciplined and human being. West Philly, there are people who would who would try to inspire you to go back in and, 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 and take care of business or whatever. He was clear what he was going to do with his money. He invested it. He was articulate. Yeah. Uh, once after a fight, we had had a thing, okay? At a fighter meeting. And it was something to do with his opponent. I'm not sure I recollect correct exactly. Um, but there was some talk about it couldn't be a black fighter or some something and Bernard objected to to the talk. You know, he didn't want to hear anything about that. He objected to it and said something nasty to uh, um, our other fight guy, our fight guy, the guy we were talking about before. Um, uh, who were we talking about before the, the, who, the fight? Oh, yeah. No, the, the, the fight and not the, 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 the fight trainer and announcer from Detroit. Oh, Bobby Chess. No, so from Bobby. Detroit. You from Detroit? Detroit? Oh, well, um, uh, Manuel Stewart. Stewart. And, and, uh, he said something really nasty to Emmanuel Stewart. He called him a, 
I, I don't remember exactly. Um, and I started, stood up and said, you don't talk to my colleague like that. And he said, F you. And about seven FUs flew back between him and me. <laughs> and I left the room and so did the rest of our team. Um, but that night after the fight, and we had an interview, and he said, Bernard said, Larry, and it was a good interview. <laughs> Larry, you and I ought to take this show on the road. <laughs> that was Bernard, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. He was dedicated to the fight world. He was dedicated to his <laughs> wife, to his family, and to success. And he did what he, he did, just what you said. He came out of jail. He didn't let anybody sideline him. And uh, I had a lot of respect for him. We were, you know, we were down training with him all the time. And uh, he did the right thing. He was he was a right. gentleman with us, with Bernard, with uh, Prince Badi, and with and Danny. He wound and, up, and he wound up with Delaware's company. Yep. And we yep. see him around all the time. Yep. And uh, he was a good source of information about certain fights. So he's got a cousin fight now. I don't know how he's doing now. I followed him a couple of years ago, but I'm not sure what he's doing now. The last couple of years, he never mentioned it, but I can recall. Larry, what, you know uh, the, the the six million dollar question. What do you think of Tyson? And and just uh, were you around him at all? Did you do some of his matches? Uh, I did all of his matches. You did all you did all of his matches, huh? Well, let me put it this big way. ones. I went up to his promoter's office a couple of blocks from the HBO offices in Manhattan. Right. Um, at the invitation of Jimmy Jacobs. Jimmy Jacobs is regarded as the Babe Ruth of handball. Totally ambidextrous, when a, was a dominant figure in that world for decades. But he was also considered a great re reference for, for his, the history of the game. Of he handball or me, boxing? Well, he might, he, uh, in the boxing history. Okay. If you had a question about boxing history, call Jimmy okay. Jack. Okay. So I go up to the office, and Jimmy sits me down in a in a little studio and plays a montage of the fighter I had never heard of, Mike Tyson. And Mike, this is Mike knocking everybody out early in his career, as most great fighters do early in their career. Right. But this was especially explosive. I took the montage up to my, my friend, Seth Abraham, who I mentioned earlier. Yep. And I said, you got to look at this. And here's an idea. Why don't we watch this guy as he grows, or doesn't, as he grows into a championship level fighter or implodes? We had never done anything like it again. And he said to me, let me talk to our boss of bosses there, a guy named Michael Fuchs, who started HBO. Mm -hmm. And they, that's what we went with. And we, we did one or two fighters, two fights that weren't that impressive. And in fact, I once ran into Michael Fuchs on the street around there, and he said, Tyson, you, you, you didn't get it right. I said, you'll see. And we saw. And we, we, uh, we carried him all the way through. 
until he tried to get me off of his telecast. What's that about? Because of some stuff I had said. I don't even remember what it was. And and um, and Seth Abraham said, no, you don't tell us who's going to broadcast our fights. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and Mike Tyson stimulated sales at HBO to a very high degree. People wanted to see him. We hadn't seen a heavyweight like that since Marciano. Yeah. You, you know, uh, so that settled down after a while. And then when his contract ran out, um, he moved to Showtime. Mike did. So we weren't friends anymore. I don't remember what I said. It couldn't have been that bad. <laughs> but I but I do know this. We were in Tokyo for the Tyson Douglas fight. I want to show you something. Hold on. What's the Douglas? This yeah, is... yeah, 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 yeah. It was sent to me by Douglas's manager, Mike Tyson, fight of the century. Yeah, wow. upset of the century. Um, that's one of my favorite fights, too, by the way. Uh, well, it was the incredible jab of Buster Douglas that was set it all up. Yeah, set it up. And yeah. Douglas is a great story. His father, who I had seen fight at the garden, he mentioned Teddy Brenner before. Brenner brought him in against a fighter who was giving him a problem on who to fight. So he says, well, we have this kid in uh, Ohio and um, just an average middleweight. Well, Buster Douglas comes to New York, comes to New York and beats the guy, and I don't remember who. And then we learned the backstory that his father had a gym in Columbus that Buster didn't really love fighting. He was a big kid, six foot one or two, three, who liked to play basketball and had a scholarship to a small college out there. And so he and his father didn't quite connect. And then his mother died two weeks before the fight with Tyson. Yeah. Um, and Douglas was the only fighter we ever saw who skipped into the ring instead of as if he was gonna, something good was gonna happen for him. Instead of making this solemn walk knowing that nothing good was going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, that, I, 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 that was incredible. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. that. I'd like to see that replay of that he skipped into the ring. Yeah. Well, after the fight, <clears throat> as you may remember, Buster was so overwhelmed with emotion. And I was going to get to the to what happened with his mother and how that might have energized him and so on. But I felt it would be better if he spoke about it first. And he was trying, but he couldn't get it out. And there was about a 25 or 30 second silence in from the guy I was trying to interview. And something in my head said, just let this go. Let people see the truth. And after a bit, 
Douglas pulled himself together. His handlers were trying to take him away to the back of the building and started to speak. When people ask me what interview I most remember, it's not the one with Floyd Jr. It's the one with, with Buster Jr. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that was an amazing event. Yeah. I yeah. thought he had a, a child that was sick. Maybe it was the next fight after that. Who, I Buster? Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know about that, but I know his mother died a few weeks yeah, before yeah. the fight. How about two other questions, Larry? Larry Holmes? And what do you think of Tyson Fury now? As I think Larry Holmes was a, an excellent fighter, but he had one big handicap. He was following Ali. Ali. Yeah. And Ali, that was, Ali made boxing. Yeah. Very, very like, hard act to follow. Yes. Yeah. Not hard, impossible. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, Muhammad Ali, again, his personality, showmanship. And then Larry was actually pretty funny as the years went on, and he had some good one-liners himself. Listen, I, I grew up yes, at that Larry, moment. you're yeah, right. Foreman, Frazier, Ali, right? And then what, Spinks came along or something like that? But what a what a golden he, era. He said watch. something about Marciano. Somebody asked him about boxing Marciano, and he laughed. And he, anyway... He's a good soul. I was at his house. The only swimming pool I ever saw shaped like a boxing glove. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you had great fighters. You had Ron Lyle. You had George Foreman. You had, you know, Bone Crusher Smith. That was a big guy, you know, later on got involved with the boxing yeah. uh, commission and stuff. Yeah, but it was the golden era of boxing as far as I'm concerned, right back around then. Well, the last era was always the golden era. Now, nah. but <laughs> yeah, but Ali changed the game. He made the game. You know, whatever it was prior to that. Of course, uh, I wasn't really uh, aware of boxing in, in the '60s. But but with Ali and the whole draft thing and changing his name from Cassius Clay. Yeah, I have to, I have to say something here. You talked about social events should not be on sports events because people are trying to get away from the real world. A lot of people didn't like Ali because he did exactly that. He yeah. was the first one to use the, the loudspeaker of television uh, about racial issues, then about religious issues. And uh, when he fought Fraser, a lot of people, especially white people, were rooting for Fraser. It's true. Because Fraser was a hell of a fighter and an action fighter, but also because he was an anti Ali. He was That's not, very true. That is very he was true. Not yes. well spoken in that regard. Right. Well, he had a great story to tell. Um, but Ali opened the door for that, for all sports. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I guess there is a yeah. point to that. He had a point to that, yeah. yeah. But I, I think it was, hand, listen, and, and I'm not a, an expert on this, but I think Larry would probably maybe agree with this. I think he handled it differently, though. He wasn't looking to be divisive. He was looking to be inclusive. True that. Yes, it was true, but yeah. um, I, does that make sense to you, yeah. John? I mean, I, I, I mean, we were young guys back then, Larry. You were obviously a, a mature adult male, but we, but at, back then, uh, the way he, he wanted to be more inclusive than divisive. And to me, that's that's okay if you want to. You know what I mean? Let's he build a broad trying, coalition yeah. rather than I don't like you because you're red, you're blue. I don't like you because you know that that's yeah, not the he, way. Yeah. I go to an arena, Larry, and for me, this was my position. I go to a sports arena. I want to high five you. I don't care who you were into, what you like, what you don't like. Right now, we're rooting for the New York Rangers, baby. In seven yesterday, in overtime, they won. <laughs> um, were there good fights on the ice? 
<laughs> they don't fight on the ice like much anymore. Said. But I, I think the other day there was a couple of good fights. I didn't see any the other, the, the other Look, night. Larry became the anti Ali in that sense, but he was not the dramatic figure that right. Ali was, right. and didn't come along in, during the uh, the war in Vietnam. Which polarized the whole country. Uh, so that outburst and that Ali's natural effusive personality, which might have gone elsewhere in another time, there was the war, people were for it or against it. And yeah, yeah, it was a big... It we we a never big. had a war where the whole country wasn't behind us. Right. Uh, so that was that. It was highly unusual for any athlete to get in front of a microphone and talk about anything except being an athlete. Right. And that was fine in its time, but that blew the cover off everything. And then you had the murder of... Uh, of of uh, Martin Sonny Liston Martin Luther Martin no Martin, not Martin Luther he died a few thousand years ago uh, but um, what's it? Sonny Liston you're talking about the controversy for, no no I'm not talking about the the uh, um, the minister the uh, Martin Luther King um, no, you're talking about assassin, uh, who was assassinated. Yeah, you're talking about who we had Lee Roslin on. You're talking about um, uh, hmm. Malcolm? Uh, Malcolm, X. Malcolm X. Malcolm X, yeah. So he could hardly avoid it. People were asking him, reporters were asking him about these things all the time. Yes, he changed his name. That's no, I don't know of any other athlete who changed his name in mid career or an <laughs> early career for yeah, that matter. It was already famous um, as Cassius Clay. But that right? was an extension of being a Muslim. What? And all of his experiences. Um, and then he had then other issues. He was a star at the 1960 yeah. Olympics. Right. Because not, not for anything political, but because he was so much fun, because he was, he was collecting all these pins and everything and, and trading them with others and, and so forth. He won where he won the light heavyweight gold medal. Um, so it was a different time, and he happened to be the guy who came along and dramatized how different it was right. from any time before or even after. So, Larry, what do you think now of a six foot six, six foot seven Tyson Fury? Six nine, uh, six eight. Is he that big? Yeah, six yeah, nine. Yeah. He's and, yeah. and he can move. I never seen a guy so that can move at that size. You are correct. Nobody has. Um, I first heard about him when he was sparring with the Klitschko's, maybe. Yeah, with the Klitschko's, yep. And um, the fact that he was a boxer, that's how he would try to impose himself on opponents by boxing them at that height and the reach he, advantage he had. Yeah. And when he went in there and, and beat up um, Wilder. Wilder, I have never seen any prize fighter in his about 30s be, after a long career as a boxer, which was counterintuitive 
that how you expect the, the biggest guy in there in the ring to do. Uh, I had never seen anybody make that kind of change where he just went from pure boxer to aggressor. I admire him for that. He knew yeah. he had to do that. You know what makes him a true champ, Lad? And you know this too. His camp stays in touch with me. His cousin's also a fighter, and they stay in touch with me. But what made me realize he's a champ is when he hit the canvas, like guys like Leonard or different guys, and they get up and they come back and they take yeah. that fight. I you know I, he has a champ quality in him. I saw the first fight with Wilder, which was a terrific fight. Um, four knockdowns in the fight, two each. Um, you know, he had such a fascinating background where he grew up in, in a, uh, as an Irish itinerant uh, gypsy kind of guy yep. Yep. In, in a particular group of people, of guys who boxed, including his father. Yes. Uh, that he probably was throwing jabs when he was two years old. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, where in Philadelphia, they threw the left hook when they were in their cribs. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny. Larry, it's been really, uh, you know, Johnny, it's been really a pleasure with Larry. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to keep him on too much longer, but unless you got something, what do you got? Larry. Uh-oh. Here Look, he goes. Can you see can that? Can you see that? Not. I can see something going on, but I'm I don't know why. three years you... old, jabbing my brother at four. <laughs> yeah. You, you, so, you, you could have been. It could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> right. You grow up with gloves on, so yeah. you know that's that world. Yep. Yeah. And Larry, listen, it's been more than a pleasure and an honor. And yeah, uh, it's just... I mean, it's incredible. And for people to hear you talk is, I know to yourself because you're you, it's not a big deal. But to yeah, the yeah. to the world, it is. This is great. And you're humble as shit. So I, honestly, it's been great. Uh, all right. I'll... I'll see you when I turn 110. Uh, we'll be out there. We'll we, come look we, we, you up. We're going to look you up. We want you back we're again. Gonna come out there and see you, <laughs> if that's all right with you. If you let us on your front porch. <laughs> all right, Larry, God bless you. Thank you so God much. God bless you, Larry, you and your family. Don't, Thank you. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. John A. Light. Good, Johnny. True John A. Light on Instagram, website, johnelite.com for books, memorabilia, uh, shows, uh, comments on uh, the great Larry Merchant, please. Anybody has any comments and we'll answer. And uh, again, hats off to you, Larry. Thank you very much. The Mike Dowd on Instagram. And did you change your life? Yes, I did. Hashtag? Go in the right direction, everybody. Enjoy your life. You have one at it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thank you, guys.